I'd like to welcome Jerry Coburn. Thank you. Hello there. Um, normally, really only get a group of people like this when I'm speaking at a funeral, so I um, feel very, very honoured. We're going to arrange it. We're all going to arrange Now, if you were an outsider and you came along and sat here last night talking to people or today, and you didn't know anything about residents' associations or ratepayers' groups, you'd think you'd been teleported somewhere into the deep part of southern USA at a society of Area 51 conspiracy theorists. <laughs> but I'm not here to tell you not to drink the Kool-Aid. What I'm here to do is present a different flavour of Kool-Aid to you. Because I've been involved with this um, movement, if you like, for 30 years now. I'm actually 79. And I just follow a very, very strong regimen of um, high carbohydrate, low exercise. <laughs> and it's, it's worked well for me. <laughs> but I, I want to just, I want to just First of all, um, explain a little bit, just a little bit about where I've come from, just so that you know that you can have a wee bit of faith in what I'm saying. So, I want to talk about what qualifies me to speak here to you. I want to discuss where we've come from as a movement. Uh, we'll, we'll call it a movement, shall we? For want of a better word. I'm going to present some information from the research I did in 2012, which is very likely still mostly relevant today. Not much has changed in that time. And then I want to talk about one of the greatest inventions the world has ever seen, almost two and a half thousand years ago. So. I have a, a bit of a varied background. Um, I'm a marketer, I guess you could call me, a marketer. I, I tell stories, um, but I've got a very strong preference for the positivist approach. So I like proof. I like proof, but I tell stories. It's a very unusual combination. Um, and, and, and evidence is very important to me. So I understand when people use that common term, evidence-based research. And I understand why some people need to see proof before they will believe. And, the, you know, there's been um, some reference to the judicial system, which, of course, is the great um, uh, hotbed of proof. Uh, and, indeed, don't confuse justice with fairness because the two uh, don't necessarily coexist together. Mm. So I'm the chief executive of a law firm called Portia. <coughs> and I'm not a lawyer, um, although <laughs> uh, I've, I've picked up a fair bit of knowledge on, on my journey. Portia is New Zealand's second largest provider of legal aid services and we are very values based. We, we are driven by this concept of access to justice and so it broke my heart listening to Bruce um, about the uh, journey because it's a valid journey. It's a valid question whether you were right or wrong. It still needed to be asked and um, one of the, the great things about legal aid, and you might want to bear this in mind, any of you, if you're ever going to court, <coughs> is that legal aid indemnifies you against cost, uh, as long as you're not, you know, over the top and vexatious. 
So uh, bear that in mind if you are ever going down the track. The problem is, of course, is that you will be hard pressed finding a lawyer who will take your case on legal aid, but that's another story for another time. So I've worked in hospitality, I've worked overseas in uh, New Zealand, I'm a qualified chef and, uh, and a civil service waiter, um, which uh, has probably been the most useful thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> um, I have lived in many different communities and, uh, and I want to just do a, a quick mehi, but I'll do it in, in, in English, if that's okay. Um, because I want you to know uh, a little bit about me, because uh, where we come from is a very important thing. So my, my mother's family, uh, the Petries, they have farmed at Wood End, well they did farm in Wood End since the, the first ships came to Christchurch, more or less. So a long generation of, of Cantabrians. And my, my father's family, the Coburns, they, um, my great 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 maybe great grandfather was the first white Pakeha born on the west coast. So they go back that far on the west coast of New Zealand. Um, the, the glorious South Island, Greymouth. Um, my uh, my great grandfather and grandfather were involved in the racing industry and um, <coughs> features in some very ancient newspapers uh, about some of the naughty things he did when he was a teenager and how he got involved with the law. Um, my, uh, my awa, my river is the Cam. It flowed right next to where I used to live, just, uh, just south of Wood End, and that's where we used to get a couple of kilos of white bait every day. Who remembers those days when you could <laughs> drop a bucket in and get some white bait out of a river? And uh, my, my maunga, my mountain, is actually not in Christchurch, it's actually in Rupehu. Um, because I was fortunate enough to live in a community called Ohakuni, just at the foot of Rupehu Maunga. Um, the most incredible, welcoming, loving community I've ever been in my life. And all of these experiences have come together to teach me about the value of people and the value of society and how we all make a community great together. And I'm sure you have those stories yourself as well. And that's why this movement is so critical to the generations that will follow us. And that's why you all deserve an accolade for being here today, for taking the time to heed the call and come here today. So, well done. Well done, you. <laughs> I was involved with the New Zealand Resilience Trust, so I was Chief Executive um, of the New Zealand Resilience Trust for a few years, and that uh, body aimed to promote community resilience way before the word resilience was even a word, <coughs> um, way before earthquakes. And uh, that in itself was an interesting journey because what I learned from that experience was that there were a number of people in communities who wanted to give but had no means to give. So we started by providing uh, free education. Now, do you remember back there what used to be the Adult Community Education Program? Thank you very much to the government that got rid of that. It was yes. only about $11,000 a year or some or $11 million or it was a tiny percentage of the budget. But boy, the, they get, got some money's worth out of that. Yeah. And we, uh, we ran courses for people about disaster preparedness. But that was only an excuse. Because what we were really doing, we were bringing people together so that we could build social capital. And very early on, we recognised that it wasn't just good enough to teach a first aid course. It wasn't just good enough to teach what to do in a disaster. What we had to do is actually let people use those skills. So we set up, we set up an ambulance <coughs> service, much to the shock of Ambulance New Zealand and 
Wellington Free Ambulance, who I used to be a, a paramedic with, that's another story. <laughs> Um, so we set up a little ambulance service, we got a wee ambulance, we set it all up. It, it didn't, you know, go 100 miles an hour to patients or anything like that. It just did jobs for, you know, council, round the, round the mountains, bike, competition, um, ride, you know, 48 hours round, wide it up, and back to Wellington, that sort of thing. And we got our local community people to come along and we gave them really flesh uniforms and they helped out. We, we had an 86 year old, God, she was a lovely woman, she was in the war, she was a radio operator in, in, the, in the Blitz uh, when she was very, very young. And, um, and, and so she, she helped operate radios. She couldn't do anything else, you know, she was pretty frail, she certainly couldn't do first aid or anything, but she, she was doing radios and that was getting her out of the house. And that was a really important thing because people in communities want to contribute. They want to help. We're seeing a degradation of that, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. Now, I worked for the Wellington City Council for my sins. Um, and when I, when I started work there, I was, I was uh, shoulder tapped I was because I was working for Water Safety New Zealand at the time. Um, and I was shoulder tapped uh, by a chap called Roger Tweedy. Now, some of you must know Roger Tweedy. Roger, if you don't know Roger Tweedy, you really need to get to know Roger Tweedy. He's <laughs> one of these people who knows absolutely everyone. And he understands community development <coughs> very well. So the Wellington City Council was setting up this fantastic new group called City Communities. And they, um, they needed senior advisors who had experience in community development. And it was very brave. They, they had Nick Toonan, who was Australian of the Year. Um, so he, he had won Australian of the Year for his, his fight for recognition of AIDS patients. And he was a fantastic advocate and a fantastic community empowerer and, 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 and organiser. He was managing the team. And, uh, and five senior advisors, and we had staff, and we had budgets. And it was going extremely well, except when I started, when I started, two things happened. The first thing is somebody said to me, when you join a council, you'll either work there for two years, or you'll be there for the rest of your life. And I went, whatever. And then the second one was when I, on my first day, I had the manager's boss come up to me and say, now, we're giving you Newlands, Johnsonville, Tawa, the northern suburbs to look after, they're a real trouble spot. And there is a guy there called Jim Candeliotis, and he is very dangerous, and we don't want you to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my first week I was like, Right, how do I get hold of this Jim Kennedy on his chat? I need to talk to this guy. So went around to him, went to his place. Um, real normal guy, you know, he used to own a fish and chip shop, then he uh, worked in waste disposal, reminded me of Tony Soprano actually, uh, but he was great. Um, wife, three, four lovely kids, um, made the best cheese and onion toasties, and, um, and we'd just sit there with cheese and onion toaster sandwiches and we'd just talk. And I said, Jim, why do they hate you so much? And he said, well, because I tell them the truth and they don't like it. So, so he and um, Tom Hall and Bernie, um, who were involved in the Federation of Wellington um, Ratepayers and Progressive Association, they would turn up to council and they'd have these cards and, and they'd have numbers on them. And when there was a, whenever you know, there was something happening, they'd hold the cards up to show you know, 10, 0, you know, like the Olympics. <laughs> And um, <laughs> code of conduct, I tell you what. <laughs> the code of conduct was probably rewritten because of Jim and his friends. <laughs> um, but the thing about Jim was he really understands that um, you need to play the long game. And that's why they found him so dangerous. Because he would, he, you'd never see him in the media. You'd never see him criticising the council. Not really but he would be behind the scenes lobbying. Oh boy, the council managers 
really, really were scared of him and they paid attention to what he had to say. So when I left council after 18 months because I was sick and tired of being told that my job was at my desk and I couldn't be out in the community, um, I, um, I knocked on Jim's door and I said, hey, Jim, we've got to do something about councils. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really like the way they're run. This wasn't me being you know, petty and getting back at them in any way. It was just sense of natural justice. So Council Watch came about, and this is one of the lessons I want you to take, please. And I'll talk about it a wee bit later too. You can scream in the wilderness all you like, but if you want people to take notice of what you're saying, you have to portray yourself as moderate, informed, and sane. Right? I'm out. <laughs> now, that is a real challenge to come across that way when you're dealing with such bullshit. Right? That is really challenging. I see it quite a lot because in, in, in my line of business, in law, I see it a lot because a lot of people who come through our doors feel very malfeased. You know, they feel that, that justice has been not done and they are angry. And the only thing you can do if you want to fix it is take the moral high ground. Because um, otherwise, you get labelled as a nutter. And then once you get labelled as a nutter, you stop being a threat. This is where Jim was so powerful because nobody would ever call Jim a nutter. Nobody, because there was just no reason to. Council Watch was very successful. It was unbelievably successful. You know, the first thing we did, Jim said to me, you know, every council has to have a local governance statement. I said, oh, really? I didn't know this. I said, okay, what's that? He goes, oh, well, it's a thing that they have to do within X number of days, 100 days, I think of coming in, or might be a year, and they have to, you know, they have to put it out there. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, I wonder how many councils in New Zealand have those? I said, well, there's this thing called Lagoima, Local Government Official Aid Information Meeting Act. Well, he knew that, obviously. I said, well, let's, why don't we just write to the councils and ask for their local governance statement? Mm -hmm. And he went, well, okay, let's do that. So we did. So we sent out 86 letters to all the councils in New Zealand and said, hey, can you please provide this? And we got uh, maybe three within 20 working days. So then we wrote to him again. We said, hey, don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a thing called Lagoima. And under Lagoima, you have this many days to respond. So we're just going to give you a wee bit more time. And we probably got about, mm, I think about 30% in the end responded. I, I can't quite remember how many. And so we went, okay, that's interesting. So we wrote to all the chief executives in New Zealand and said, hey, I don't know if you're aware, but your council staff obviously don't know what your, what the rules are around official information. You know, here are what those rules are. I'm going to not take questions, not, no, not till the end. Um, okay. Then we set out and asked another question. And we got a wee bit more response. And then by the time we asked the third question, I can't remember what they were now, but they were just documents that we, you know, they needed to provide us. Um, we started getting phone calls from various um, councils asking us why we wanted it, and local government New Zealand wanted to know what we were doing. And of course, we were publishing all of this on our website, councilwatch.org.nz. And then after the third one, we filed 135 complaints to the Office of the Ombudsman. Oh, Beverly Wakeham, she must have loved us that week. That really blew her budget. <laughs> and of course, they have to go by and examine every single one of them. And, and I think just about every single one of them got an official letter saying, you must comply with this, etc., etc. Now, that, that, that was fun, but it taught the councils something. It taught the councils that they needed to be a wee bit more um, aware uh, that they had responsibilities because at the start when we started this none of the councils knew we were writing to other councils 
they just thought we were writing to them. But when you present it as the whole country, that becomes a news story. And it's evidence-based research. You cannot deny it. That's the sort of story that gets questions asked in Parliament. And it starts embarrassing the minister. So we learnt a lot from that. We really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, we were very tired and I started the business. But around the same time, we also did the National Residents Association's database. And um, that then came around, sort of that started informing my, my thoughts around doing some research because I wanted to know, well, what do residents associations do? Because one of the big problems we had dealing with the council, and one of the problems I had in council when I was trying to advocate for residents associations, was, well, what mandate does that residents association have? They say they represent the people, but where, do they, where does it show? Because the council, by law, is mandated to represent the people. Right? Okay, so that's, that's problem number two. Problem number one, coming across as credible. Problem number two, having a mandate. Now, I just want to segue a little bit here because I want to um, go back to that, that whakapapa, if you like, the history and where we've come from. And I, I just want you to understand this because you carry on a tradition that has been around for a long time before the colonisation of New Zealand, right? And some of the things that you're going to see will make you reflect a little bit about how we do things and whether or not it's necessarily the right way of doing things. So, I'm just going to read from this because it's, it's, it's stellar writing. From the New Zealand historical record covering the late 19th century, it's apparent that residents associations or residents groups had in their roots a direct involvement in the election of councillors and lobbying on behalf of property owners. Residents groups stretch back to at least 1865, when a report made mention of resolutions the Christchurch Ratepayers Association would pass in the town hall. So that, that, that's relevant, isn't it? The ratepayers associations were using the, de the democratic process because they had elected officials as councillors in the town hall. It was a time of ratepayers organising together to battle the authorities with a notice in the Daily Southern Cross newspaper calling for a meeting of the Auckland Ratepayers Association to petition the General Assembly against passing the Water Loan Bill. The Grey River Argus in 1875 reported on the perceived lack of success of the Wellington Ratepayers Association, uh, which they called a sort of imitation of the Nelson Reform League, due to a certain level of apathy of the ratepayers of that city. Right? Do, do these things start touching a wee bit of a... Yeah? Mm? Okay. Now, interestingly enough, let me tell you that the, the, um, the Nelson Reform League was probably the second ratepayers association in New Zealand. So you say you've got about a 20 year history here. No, it goes back a lot longer than that, yeah. Ratepayers groups seem to be a treasure, treasure trove of salacious news. And in 1876, the Evening Post made blatant accusations against a chap called Mr. E.T. Gillen of misleading the ratepayers to the real state of the corporation's affairs, the city council's affairs. The issue was over the auditing of the council's finances and reported that it was very desirable that the upcoming meeting of the local ratepayers association be well attended. Gillen was a Wellington provincial councillor and bizarrely was the editor of the Evening Post newspaper at the time this report was published. So at least nobody could argue about the, um, uh, about the editorial independence of the day. Again, doesn't history repeat itself over and over? So early records of meetings from residents groups in New Zealand were reported in the major metro uh, newspapers of the day. Um, mentions of the Auckland Ratepayers Association, 
discussing the urgent need to, need to drain the market reserve to prevent the ravages of typhus while a report in the Evening Post in 1875 that the monthly meeting of the Wellington Ratepayers Protection Association was held with 11 people present. It's more than many today. Mm. Discussion centering around the application of rating income and the issue of inequity, which is significant considering they remain major issues 150 years later. Also of present day relevance was the suggestion for implementing water meters and the safety of public areas. In the 1930s, this is all available, and I'll show you the website, this is all available, it's very, very interesting. In the, in, the, um, in the 1930s, New Zealand had developed a welfare state, with central government taking hands-on role in community well-being. And it started, that welfare state started going down in the 1960s. Um, with um, a lot of a lot of um, freedoms being argued, so we had in the 1960s um, the feminist movement coming to a, a real height. Well, I mean, let's face it, it goes stretches all the way back to Kate Shepherd and beyond, but but it was was really coming into into the into the time. There was the the anti-war um, um, situation in Vietnam. Um, and all sorts of other things. And so this was another change in the 1970s. We saw another change in the way uh, governments regarded uh, individuals. And of course, come the 2000s, we get chaps like this and others um, under the uh, local government reforms. Now, I've jumped, I mean, I've jumped a, a million miles through, through the ages, but Something that was significant that you probably don't don't know is that in the 19th century there were over 4,000 residence groups in New Zealand, um, and there were about that same number of local bodies, right? and that had dropped to. 850 by 1989, like local bodies, yes. and that now is 86, maybe 85, oh no, less than 86, of course, because it's super city. Hmm? 79, 78. Now. yep. 78, okay. Now, what this represents is a centralisation of power and a decentralisation of democracy, if you like. All right? So we, we all know that this has happened, and so the times, they have a changed. There's already talk about the new era. The next era where many jobs will be replaced by robotics and computers, where liberal democracies that seem so certain after the fall of fascism and communism are starting to be rejected by ordinary citizens. Think about Brexit. Think about the rise of Trump, uh, Macron, um, Justin Trudeau. All of these are indicators that people are starting to become uncomfortable with the globalisation, if you like, of, of the world. It's an era of post-globalist nationalism. But one thing is certain, there will always, always be a handful of people concerned enough to form a residence group. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about your movement. It's, well, it's fascinating. What I did with this research is I took a look at the literature. That's usually where you start with research. And what I found is that there wasn't really any real definition of what a residence group was anywhere in the world, which is not a great thing to do when you start off doing research. And at, at that time, I probably should have just dropped everything and done something on trains or something. But um, I, I continued. Um, I thought I might make some contribution. So I, I read a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, that's supposed to be all of the stuff that I read, but. Oh, there it is. Right. Yeah. Huge. 
Um, I read a whole bunch of literature, and, and what I did is I came up with 11 um, categories of what a residence group does. And then I had a look back in the historical record of New Zealand, so right from the 1865 all the way through using um, um, papers passed from the archives, using media uh, reports, publications and things like that, and I drew out another um, five uh, things that, that residence groups did. And I, I, had a, I had to think of it like this. There's the liberal state and the civil society organisations. Now this came from the 2010 conference we had in, in Wellington. And there's a difference because, for example, the liberal state's about the protection of property, but civil society is about people. Right? You can see the difference there, can't you? So there's a tension. Um, the liberal state's driven by ideology, but, but civil society is driven by more moral values. So even though we exist in this liberal democracy, there's still tension between government, which is the representative of that um, infrastructure, and people. And you, as civil society, are the representatives of those things on that side. So I wanted to ask some questions. And those are the questions I, I asked myself. Um, when I looked at the literature, how did it match the purposes? Um, when I read the constitutions of residence associations, how did those align with what the people who were on the board or the committee said? Um, did it make any difference if they were in, in a rural area or an urban area? And how had the purposes of residence associations changed in those time periods that I talked about? Well, those, those things there are the, 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 the categories of residence associations, or reasons for residence groups that I discovered. And these ones here were the additional categories that I came out from looking at the historical record. Now, I should actually say, the historical record also included um, 588 constitutions that I read, every single one of them. Oh yes, I'm an expert on constitutions now. <laughs> including, and I have, it really broke my heart, one in my um, wife's father's handwriting, he died um, when she was quite young, who started the Beckenham Neighbourhood Association um, with, with the intent of building a little wee bridge across the, uh, the river to allow the children to get from Beckenham across to the school. And, uh, and yes, and it was in his handwriting and my wife was helping me actually analyse all of this and it was quite a, a touching sort of thing, wouldn't you think that would be? Um, so, in terms of purposes, this is what I came up with. Now, just remember that this is research, and research sometimes doesn't necessarily align with reality, right? As my friend Jim will say, if, um, if it works in theory and it works in practicality, then the theory is correct, but if it works in practicality but doesn't work in theory, then the theory is incorrect. What actually matters is what happens in real life. These are the sort of different categories of residence groups in New Zealand. Um, each one has a hybrid, right? So, so there are ones that are purely demographic, purely body corporate, and purely community, and there are ones that are hybrids of this. So the main three, community, that's you, I, I guessing, most, most, mostly. Body corporate, there's actually quite a few residence groups in New Zealand registered at the behest of council because the council requires it to undertake a development. They're not really used. Some are, but most of them are late dormant. 
because it's just a requirement. The demographic one are places like rest homes that might have a residence group for, for, for the residents, and it's like a social club in a way. This is the response that I got around the country. Now, hard to see, but basically um, the lighter chunk is the percentage response of surveys that I sent to each part. So you will see that uh, Canterbury, probably about nearly 50%. <laughs> Southland, um, not a very good response. Um, West Coast, lots. Um, Hawke's Bay, not much. So again, you've got to bear in mind that when I'm talking about this, um, the, the, the survey is not necessarily 100% um, uh, population of all residents' associations. But I got enough back for it to be statistically significant. Um, in, in fact, I, I, got, um, I got quite a, quite a few. I got 582 usable responses back. So. The first question was more or less about um, how the constitutional purposes aligned with what the committee members thought they should be doing. And I found this fascinating because what it shows is that your organisations, when you say in the constitution, this is what we do, it matches what you think that you should be doing. Does that make sense? And some of these constitutions stretched back a hundred years. There were some really old constitutions there, but people were uh, significantly truthful to their constitutional purpose. There's just that little piece there, which was interesting. Um, a lot of constitutions said, talked about well-being and leadership, but that, and not a lot of that came through in terms of what um, people said. So that might be something just to reflect upon. You can go back and have a look at your own constitutions and see how you fit with those particular things. That, by the way, also could have something to do with the Charities Act as well, that you might have required that in your constitution. Did the age of the organisation have an influence? So this shows three colours, and those three colours from dark to light show the different eras of when the um, uh, Residence Association was started. Um, you can see there that in the 1970s to 2002, transparency and critiquing popped up, and then it went down again after 2002. Again, it might be something to do with the Charities Act, because, I, I mean, I've taken a case to the High Court um, against the Charities Commission, uh, because they said that the foundation that ran Residence Association, the Draco Foundation, Draco, <laughs> um, was uh, not a charity because we were political. Interesting. That's been overturned now, by the way, with the Greenpeace decision, but yeah, we need a lot of reapplying. So um, the significant differences in purpose, either constitutionally, or, and that says, or stated by committee members, between those in urban areas and those in rural areas? Well, there's probably that, the leadership side of things. I, I, yeah, I don't think there's enough there to say that, that organisations in the rural areas are much different from those in urban areas, but... Um, And um, was there any difference in terms of the regions? Well, again, there was a little bit of difference. Um, Wellington and Canterbury were quite focused on the sense of place. Um, you'll see that Canterbury had a lot of local interest there. There's a lot of NIMBYs <coughs> in Canterbury, so. Um, not many body corporates in Canterbury because they didn't require them for developments, but a heck of a lot um, elsewhere. Um, not many managing assets in Canterbury, but, but, but Christchurch have always had the, the, local, uh, the local community boards. And I know a, lot, a number of other um, organisa uh, another, um, locations in New Zealand don't have community boards, like Wellington, they've got a couple and that's it. So. 
Uh, some of the smaller areas, Bay of Plenty, even though that was a small response, transparency didn't really um, come into it. Um, but there was uh, quite a, a, a few standouts when it came to protecting institutional knowledge and, ho and being the holder of that knowledge. Interestingly enough, 35% of the body of, of um, Northland was body corporates. <coughs> now, I, I threw this question in because I was really interested to see what sort of um, rapport um, residents groups had with councils and DHBs, etc. And um, there is very little relevance. The, the most shocking one was DHBs. Hardly any interaction with DHBs. Even though the model of healthcare in this country is community-based healthcare. But, you know, even though every three years, you know, they, they come to you and say, hey, vote for us for DHB. Civil defence, I threw that one in there as well because my experience with disaster management stuff. So I thought, I know what the answer to that's going to be, and, and actually I was surprised it was only 51% that was never. But there were a few areas that were really, you know, um, had, their, had their stuff together. Community boards, were, for those that had them, they were good. Yep. Council officers, better than you'd expect. And local councillors felt 14% didn't have any interaction with the local councillor. Could you even imagine that? Unbelievable. So, you can find this um, information at that address. Right? You can find the research and you can have a look yourself. Look, I went through all, I went through my thesis on Friday, it took me... Could you just move it on to write it Oh, yeah, okay. I went, I went through it on Friday, it took me 13 hours, and I was bored to tears by the end of it. <laughs> so I, I really wanted to rush through this part so that you didn't get bored to tears with me. But there is some interesting stuff in there. What What's... What's really in there is an invitation to do more, more research. That's just the beginning. There's more to come, I don't think by me, but maybe. So, I'll bring that up, I'll bring that up at the end. Okay, this is the, this is the nitty gritty. How are we doing for time, John? You've got uh, 17 minutes. Right, <coughs> this is the nitty gritty. Can you guess what the invention of the year was in 3500 BC? Banking. Banking was actually the Templars in the 13th century. Yeah, Knights Templars. True mm -hmm. um, So I'm going to talk about the invention of the year. I'm going to talk about what people fear the most. This is going to help you. I'm going to talk about the key difference between human beings and councils. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what my superhero power would be, and then I'm going to finish on a plea. So in 3500 BC, the wheel was invented. Just make a note of that, just so that you don't go ahead and try and do that again. Because this is one thing that really gets on my nerves, is yeah. the recreation of the same thing. Now, this happens at different levels. It happens at the community level. Because people come together for a purpose with residence groups. They are almost a vessel for whatever is happening at the time. They don't necessarily exist continuously, and they certainly don't exist in the same way. But the danger is, if you don't somehow capture that knowledge, then everyone goes away, a few years later, something happens, and all, everybody comes back and goes, we should do this, because blah! And of course, I'm sure you've all seen it, and I'm sure you've all gone, oh, this... 
you have to come out of retirement and tell them all again what you did in the past. <laughs> now, that's fantastic for councils because, you know, all you're doing is just putting all your energy into redoing the same stuff all the time. It happens also at an organisational level, and this is why a national affiliation cooperative or whatever this turns out to be <coughs> is so important because you can be the holders of knowledge not only about what happens in communities but what happens in different communities as was mentioned by um, two speakers so far and actually from the audience too. Let's not forget the fights we've had and let's share the information so everybody knows. It's really important. <coughs> Who would you want to be regarded as? Because I'm telling you right now, you go up to anybody just randomly in the street and yell at them about the conspiracy of the judiciary to support local government's rapacious ratings against innocent people, and they're going to run a mile because that's what they're going to see. Right? Or would you rather be this? Because this is the face of reason. Now, you can still have the same opinions, but how you present them is absolutely essential. You want to avoid being called nutters, or grumpy old men, or nimbies, or whatever. Because these are labels that are put upon people to um, disempower them. Right? How you behave is going to affect your ability to affect change because the people you need to influence are not councillors, they are not politicians. They are not council staff, they are the public. Right? This is the difference between human beings and councils. Is that this lady is dead. And she fought a good fight. She fought a good fight and I, I knew her when we were doing council watch. But I, I lost track, touch with her. And many of you in this room have known her better than I. We only live for so long. But those councils have been around way beyond our great-great-grandparents' time. And they will be into the future too. So choose the way you fight and choose your battles. Choose them carefully. <clears throat> it would be wonderful if the whole world stood up to injustice or unfairness like Penny Bright. But it's just not possible in many, 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 many cases and it's not, it's not a lack of courage. It's not a fear of having your house taken off you or anything like that. It's just that we're scared. If I was a superhero, I would be empty space person. No. If I was a superhero, um, apart from having the power to fix PowerPoints, I would be Captain Realistic. I would be able to look at myself from outside and see myself as others saw me. And I would be able to moderate what I did to have the best impact. Now, one of the really important things I want to ask you is don't present this image to the public. If you do, you will be discarded. It doesn't matter if your cause is just. It doesn't matter how right or wrong you are. 
If that's what the public see, then you will be yesterday's fish and chip paper. Now, I'm not just going to leave it at that and say these are all the things you shouldn't do. Because I have, I'll put that back up again. I've actually got a list of things you should do. And I hope that you could take this on board when the decision making comes tomorrow about how you're going to move forward. If you want to win people's trust, you need to build strong networks in your communities. Do you know why he, I did a, 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 a very Pakeha mihi at the start? I wanted to bring that into this room to remind you that your communities are not grey-haired white people. Right. We have very diverse communities very and all of those people suffer from rates. There is an equal <laughs> thing that joins everyone together. Get to know them. Get to know your communities and be the focus in your community for social capital. Social capital has two parts. The first part is the presence of strong network. The second part is something not of monetary value that can be exchanged through those networks. Churches and schools don't really talk to each other, do they? No, it's an uncomfortable coexistence in a community in most cases. But the Residents Association through its, um, so in Newlands, when I was with the Residents Association in Newlands and through the New Zealand Resilience Trust, we built a good relationship with a local um, group of the local pastors, so the Baptist Church, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the Methodists, I think the Seventh-day Adventists weren't involved because they didn't want to be, and I think the local synagogue, and there was, a, there was a, a, a Muslim group there as well. And they all met once a month. They met once a month. And so I, oh, I went along to one of these meetings once, and I sat down with them, and I said, look, this is what, we, this is what we're wanting to do for our community. And they went, well, well that's wonderful. That, that's really firing the spirit of what we want to do for this community. I had no idea that the churches all talked to each other and they were talking about things like youth programs and, and how to um, help the local food bank and things like that at that level, at that grassroots level. So a residence group, be it a ratepayers association or a progressive association or whatever, has the power to be this, the, the neutral point for a very strong social capital network. Now, I would say you should be meeting with all of these community organisations on a regular basis, but before you even do that, you should find out who they are. You should find out who they are, and instead of sending an invitation and waiting in an empty community hall on a Wednesday night for them to all turn up and rush to your meeting, you should go to their meeting and you should just sit there and listen to what they have to say and bring that back to your meeting. Learn about effective community development. There, there is a thing called community development. It's something that many people even who work in community development don't understand. It can be a very powerful <coughs> force for change. Incorporate those principles into your organisation. Undertake solid research. Find out about your community. Who lives in your community? Where do they work? Who's left there at home during the day? What are their needs and desires and values? Now, one of the things we did was develop what's called the Newlands model, and that's been taken up also in St Albans and Christchurch. Now, the Newlands model was us saying we've had it, with dealing with council, we're no longer going to play the game of going along to meetings and submitting things and and you know reading the six million pages of the long-term plan and all of that sort of stuff because really it's a bit of a sideshow. What we're going to do is we're going to ask our community what they want. We're going to put 20 projects together, divide them into four groups, and then get 
four people in the community to project manage each group. And that's going to be a 10 year project. So we surveyed every single household. We sent out 6,000 surveys or some, I mean, amazing, I can't remember how many we sent out. It was, it was lots, thousands, thousands. It was a great team building exercise. And we got back not much. But, but do you know what? There were a lot of people who knew that the Newlands Residents Association were doing something in their community because of that. But that's okay, we got back enough. And, and we, we looked through here, and we, we basically got a little algorithm, and we said, oh, okay, we see a lot of people said this, and a lot of people said that, and we put those all together, and we published it. And we sent it to the council, and we said, here you go, council, this is Newlands, aspirations for the next 10 years and we've got this person and this person's a project manager for this company and they are volunteering to do this and then this person here and this person here right and the council were really miffed <laughs> they weren't at all very happy about this they rang they rang us they rang me they said oh yeah yeah look um we want you to come and talk to us. We want the council want you to come and talk to them about the Newlands model. And I said, no. <laughs> if you want to talk to us about the Newlands model, we're meeting on Wednesday in the community centre. You're welcome to send one of your people along. <coughs> and they did. And they had all sorts of questions. And we said, no, 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 no. We're not answering your questions. This has got nothing to do with council. And then after a while, after a few months, because the, you know we keep getting a, some good publicity, they started saying things like, well, well, how can we be involved in this? Well, we don't need you to be involved in this. We're doing it ourselves. It's OK. <laughs> and then what happened a wee bit later is that our project managers would call the relevant council officer. So if it was about a roading thing, they'd, they'd call up the relevant council officer and say, hey, I'm the project manager for the Newlands, um, for the Newlands thing, this thing here. I um, wonder if um, I, I could come meet with you at some stage and we just have a little talk over some information I want to know. And suddenly it goes from loony community organisation to professional people one-on-one -on -one talking to the appropriate people in council. Right? All that information is available. Make a plan for change, that's it. Don't just tell the council what your community wants. Make it happen yourself. Don't expect the council to do it for you. It'll really annoy them. Pick a goal and go for it. Establish a mandate. So we got a mandate out of the Newlands model because we had surveyed people. And then every, um, every three years, we'd go back and we'd resurvey people again and say, Here, here's, here's what we've got. What, what do you think? And so we kept building that mandate, right? Join together and form a national body. One that can provide a charter that all groups can follow. Prove that you can stick to your charter. It might take five years, it might take 10 years. But eventually you will build up enough credibility that central government might start consulting with you in a meaningful way. In which case you say, no, thank you, we don't really need to talk to you. But that's okay, because you've got their attention, right? And be honest to yourself and others, finally. Don't tilt at windmills. The council isn't your enemy. It's just a mindless and uncaring machine. It will only respond to reason and logic and evidence, and only then if you have leverage. Listen to yourself regularly, and if you are finding that people are coming along to one meeting and they're never turning up again, you probably have an image problem. If you are truly doing this for the good of the community, then you need to put the community ahead of your own personal ambition and desires. And that is it. So I thank you for your time.